the Castro regime, uh, in their socialist Marxist ways, they decided that they would be the only economy. So Cubans are barred from doing any commerce, pretty much. Uh, they can't even grow their own food for their own consumption. And any farmers that there are on the island must sell to the Cuban regi regime. So this, of course, leads to shortages because the Cuban regime does not pay enough to grow the crops and uh, sustain the animals and so on and so forth. It's the same thing we saw happen in Venezuela. It's it's generally um, what happens when somebody wants a central planned economy in this form. Can I pause for a second and, and just note that uh, we got Brian on here who's getting uh, Congressman Massey on and our typical lineup includes like homeless people that believe in Bigfoot. <laughs> Welcome to The Brian Nichols Show, your source for common sense politics on the We Are Libertarians Network. The Brian Nichols Show is the fastest growing liberty podcast that brings together people from all means of political thought as we seek to have meaningful conversations about the issues you care about. At The Brian Nichols Show, our goal is to leave the audience educated, enlightened, and informed. And now your host, Brian Nichols. Well, happy Wednesday there, folks. Brian Nichols here on The Brian Nichols Show. Thank you, of course, for joining us on another fun-filled episode. Today is a special episode because we are talking about Cuba Libre. Yes, free Cuba, and I am having Martha Bueno. She is returning to the program. Martha is a, of Cuban descendants, her mom and dad coming from Cuba. You heard her amazing story uh, back when she was on the program on the Sunday Candidate Highlight Series. Her mom breaking her dad out of jail from Cuba and then coming to the United States. So Martha's joined the program today to discuss, number one, how we got here. Yes, 62 years later, how the Cuban people are now rising up and standing for Cuban freedom, a great conversation. Thank you, Martha, for joining us on, yes, a very important top-of-mind issue. So with that being said, on to the show, Martha Bueno here on The Brian Nichols Show. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate this. Absolutely, Martha. You're here today. Unfortunately, it's not something, well, no, maybe it is something we should be excited about, but there's definitely some, some sadness that comes with it because right now there is some absolutely just, it looks like, stuff out of a movie coming out of Cuba right now. And uh, I wanted to have you on the show because obviously folks here in the Brian Nichols show are familiar with your story. You are running right now as a libertarian for a Miami-Dade commissioner down there in Florida as a big L libertarian. But your history, your background, your story, it does have its roots coming directly from Cuba. And I said, we need to have Martha on to explain exactly what's happening. So let's start off first and foremost, Martha Bueno. Welcome back to the program. What's been going on since you were last in the show? Oh boy, so much. I mean, that's like such an open-ended question, right? So um, I'm gonna get right down to the important parts. What's been happening since the last time I was here? Well, the people of Cuba have uh, spoken up and spoken out and are currently on the streets of Cuba fighting for their liberty, which is exactly what we at the Libertarian Party believe in. It's uh, giving people that freedom, you know, making sure that they are able to um, be free, not have a government rule over them. And that's what we're seeing in Cuba. So this is the libertarian story in the making. And I, I teased when I said the sadness that comes with it, because I, I just saw Spike Cohen, former VP candidate here for the Libertarian Party and good friend, uh, tweet that so far 147 people have been confirmed missing right now that's in right. Cuba. So you're seeing a response really a strong arm response from the Cuban government. And this is not something that's new. This isn't something that has just come out of the woodwork. This has been stuff that has quite literally been festering behind the scenes for, at this point, generations. So Martha, when you were on the show, back originally discussing your candidacy and talking about your backstory, you discussed how your father was in, in Cuban jail and your mom broke him out like a badass, which is incredible. So folks, go back, check out that episode because it was incredible. But Martha, let's now discuss the actual history of what we're seeing right now, the, the Castro regime, or at the very least, the fading remnants of what was this communist dictatorship. Where, where did this all begin and how, how did we get here, essentially? Right. So without giving you too much of a history, um, this is 62 years in the making. So Castro took over. There was a, a, a dictatorship back then as well, the Batista regime which um, was very friendly to the United States. And Cubans saw that as um, the United States, as an imperialism. And Castro took advantage of that concept of, oh, we got to get the United States out of here. And that, uh, you know, there was a revolution. I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of quickly going over the history here, but 
ever since Castro took power um, at the very end of the 50s, uh, 1959, I believe, um, this situation has just kind of been starting. So uh, back then, um, Castro, you know, we hear all the stories about Che Guevara and a lot of people were were uh, killed, murdered. Um, and this has been going on for a long time. The, the Castro regime, uh, in their socialist Marxist ways, they decided that they would be the only economy. So Cubans are barred from doing any commerce, pretty much. Uh, they can't even grow their own food for their own consumption. And any farmers that there are on the island must sell to the Cuban regi regime. So this, of course, leads to shortages because the Cuban regime does not pay enough to grow the crops and uh, sustain the animals and so on and so forth. It's the same thing we saw happen in Venezuela. It's it's generally um, what happens when somebody wants a central planned economy in this form. And so um, things have just progressively gone, gotten worse before Cuba was reliant on Russia. After that, uh, Cuba was reliant on Venezuela and their oil. And that has dried up pretty much as well. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden you have these factors where Cuba's dirt poor, I hear a lot of people talking about the embargo, but the embargo was something that um, only affects a certain certain industries. And the United States can and does actually ship uh, food and medicines to Cuba. So the people in, in Cuba are just extremely poor. They have no future. They have no way of, of improving their lives. And then you add to that that right now uh, COVID is rampant on the island. The uh, regime decided to turn down international help for um, for uh, vaccines. They uh, people are showing up to hospitals. There's no medicine. People are laying on the floors of the hospital because there's no beds. Obviously, there's no ventilators. There's just no resources. Uh, food has gotten extremely expensive in Cuba to the point where people are just there's not even any bread left. Uh, people are starving, literally starving to death. Um, and then you have this oppressive regime that on top of all of this now or always has been um, blocking people from being able to even communicate that we've been seeing for months now artists uh, in, in the Cuban, you know, artists that live in Cuba protesting. Um, that started with San Isidro and um, it just keeps escalating and escalating. And this Sunday we saw it come to a head and the people all across Cuba went out onto the streets and said, no more. For the first time in 62 years, they were like, we've had enough. There's nothing to eat. We have no freedoms. Uh, even internet connections at this point, the government has shut down uh, all internet connections, most phone lines. They have very little power. Their power infrastructure has completely failed. And without the Venezuelan government providing them with oil, they have no gasoline. They have no electricity. It's just a complete failure. Every industry in Cuba has failed to the point where um, people are going hungry. And there's only so much you can do to a population before they say no more. And um, the Cuban government is now going after people. Uh, like you said, there's over 140 people, probably more at this point. That was uh, earlier numbers. One of them, uh, part of the Cuban um, Libertarian Party, who is missing. And it's not only herself, it's herself and her husband. And unfortunately, her child is also missing. And I want to thank Spike Cohen for retweeting that. Um, that was a tweet that that my friend and co-host Zach Foster put out there. Um, he has been trying to get information on where uh, these people are, um, especially the libertarians that we have contact with and has had no luck other than to know that that before uh, we lost contact with them, they had gotten beat up very badly. Um, and then, uh, you know, troops are, that, that were out in Venezuela, the Cuban troops that were out in Venezuela are back on the island. Um, the Cuban uh, current president, President Miguel Díaz-Canel, <laughs> said that um, he gave the, the word to absolutely allow for the military to, to take arms against the population. And we're seeing that. We're seeing them on the streets. And what's worse, they don't even wear their uniforms. A lot of the times, these police officers are plain clothed so that people um, don't know who they are and that they're armed. They also are instigators. And um, it's just absolutely horrific what we're watching. And there's not a whole lot we can do, unfortunately, from here. So right now, and you you preface, I think you hit the name of the show. It's 62 years in the making because this, this is something that we've seen 
echo across the country, or not the country, across the world. We saw this with the Hong Kong protests right before COVID-19 hits. Uh, we're seeing this, uh, I mean, you look at Europe. We've seen pop-ups of all these kind of, you know, eruptions of people saying enough. I, I think mo more recently to the UK, specifically in London, there's been a lot of protests. And now this, this is actually like a huge deal because to your point, for the most part, the Cuban people have been relatively okay. Like not okay, but just like it, it, there's Gare. nothing you can do. Yes. And, and, now and one of the chants that they were saying on the streets is we're not scared anymore. They are so wow. fed up that they aren't scared anymore. And you have to see that there's a role that the internet has played in this. So up until December of 2018, Cubans had no access to cell phones or internet. Oh, wow. And, and that, that recently changed. I mean, only what, three years ago. And so all of a sudden, all of these Cubans have cell phones and access to Facebook. Facebook is huge for Cubans. And so not only were they sharing their own stories to the rest of the world, but they were sharing their stories to each other. Before this, they were scared to communicate with each other. You would speak to Cubans and say, hey, how's life for you in Cuba? And they'd be like, well, it's wonderful because they couldn't tell you the truth because they were scared. And so as soon as they got access to the internet and Facebook and started posting about what's going on and, and seeing that other people were, were being brave and, and posting their own stories, they kind of, it's, it's escalated, right? It's, 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 um, it's grown. This movement is completely organic and has grown from nothing to where it is right now, which is an entire population of Cubans on the island that are saying, we're done. Yeah. Well, and, and then I, that's my next question. What was, I mean, was there rather a kind of powder keg event? You mentioned that this Sunday was really kind of the culmination where we're seeing now some acts against the state, which I mean, good for the, I mean, God bless those people for what they're doing. But was there anything that really led to this ultimate escalation at this point in time? I mean, like I said, it was just a, a group of, of things, right? So it was, um, there's been a lot of reports coming out on the COVID-19 situation. So you have to remember that one of the things that, that not just here in the US, what they're told in Cuba is this is a system that you accept and you live by so that you have access to this free healthcare and this free education. And people are realizing now, finally, again, with the help of the internet, that they're not living the life that they were told because they've been cut off from the rest of the world. It happens in North Korea as well. People think this is it. This is the best that's going on in the world. This is the best country in the world. They had no way to compare. Uh, people traveling outside of Cuba just wasn't uh, a, a thing for regular folk. And I say that because there's video and evidence of Sandro Castro, for example, uh, Fidel's, uh, I think, grandchild out in Europe. So if you were part of the elite group, um, you were able to leave and you're able to maybe compare and see, you know, compare if your life in Cuba is good or not. But the rest of Cubans, they weren't. They were, they are um, tied to an island and they have no way of comparing, no way of seeing until these cell phones arrived. And now they're like, wait a minute, um, you mean supermarkets in the United States in this imperial country that we've been hearing for 60 plus years, how miserable and horrible it is? You mean they have all sorts of food? Um, and we in the best country in the world don't have it. So it's really hard to contain information. And that's what we're seeing right now. We're seeing information spreading and information being taken to heart and information being turned around and saying, you know what? We're done. We're good. <laughs> uh, I wish they could do it with with no bloodshed. But, um, you know, we hear this as libertarians all the time that you can vote your way into socialism, but you got to fight your way out of it. So what's... And this is the tough part, right? Because I'm sitting here in Philly. Granted, you're down in Miami, so you're you're closer to the action. But like, what can we do? I mean, what is there that we can give a call to action to people to to help? I mean, is there anything we can do in terms of supporting those those freedom fighters in Cuba, Martha? Um, I'm actually heading to a meeting a little later today to discuss with uh, other Cuban members of the community um, what we think can be done. To be honest with you, I think the first and foremost thing that we must do is to ask our representatives to remove the proclamation. It's Proclamation 6867, which was signed in 1996 by Bill Clinton, and it prohibits uh, anyone, any American, from going into Cuban waters. They signed this, or Bill Clinton signed this, because of the uh, Hermanos al Rescate, uh, the, the Brothers to the Rescue, that plane that was shot down over Cuba. 
Um, and so he signed this saying, well, no, that's it. Nobody else is going to go to Cuba. And um, that's the end of that. And it's actually holding us back now. There are many Cubans and others here in Miami or around the country that would like to go to Cuba and take humanitarian aid. Unfortunately, we can't do it uh, through the Cuban government. We can't, for example, rent a plane and ship uh, water and supplies and food because the Cuban government will just take it as they have done. There's plenty of video and evidence that uh, you can find all around the internet of people buying things in Cuban stores that say not for individual sale and, and the name of the aid that, that provided it. Um, the Cuban government does not care. And when they, they didn't accept the vaccines from the international community, it's speculated that it's because they knew they couldn't sell them. And the Cuban government doesn't do anything at all that doesn't benefit them directly. So uh, just like they turn down vaccines, if we send a plane with aid, it's not gonna reach the people, it's gonna go to the government. So at this point in time, the best thing we can do for Cubans is to keep a spotlight on the island. The Cuban regime has cut, like I said earlier, all their communication. Thankfully, somebody very, very smart, way smarter than I am, set up a VPN, mm -hmm. a satellite-based VPN, and spread it through the island. This has literally kept us being able to communicate with the island, but also for Cubans to communicate amongst themselves, which has been critical because that way they've been able to keep this going and find out. So today, there's not a whole lot of protests going, at least not in the parts of Cuba that I have contact with because they were able to share that, um, you know, the, the police is out in full force. So they've stayed behind, they've calmed it down just a little bit, but that doesn't mean that we're done. It just means that, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna wait and see maybe, or, or maybe take up at another time, not really sure, but definitely that, that VPN has been a lifesaver. And again, it was a satellite based VPN. So there's no way for the Cuban government to take it down, which is, Absolutely beautiful. I am loving the technology and people coming together to solve this problem. So again, going back to what we can do for Cuba, I hope to have better answers for you shortly. Um, but until the United States removes that um, proclamation, the problem is going to be if even if we get people to Cuba and they risk their lives and they take the stuff, when they come right back to the country, they can and probably will be arrested and or worse. And I'm just thinking that it's probably so easy for our elected officials to just remove that. It's one proclamation. It wasn't even signed by Congress. <laughs> you think, right? I mean, we hope it would be that easy. Is it that easy? Well, here, it's Proclamation 680 or 6867. So yeah. we'll put that in the show notes so folks can make sure they call the representatives and bring that up. But you know what's funny, Martha, as you were telling that story, it, it made me think, really, government, and we're seeing this exemplified in Cuba, ultimately ends up really showcasing all of the worst attributes that our friends in the left say that big corporations will do. If, right. if they were if they were left on their own in this, this dreaded free market. It's like, oh, it, it has nothing to do with the consolidation and monopolization of power <laughs> using the state or anything, right? And then in this case, the ones with the guns. And, and we're seeing this. I mean, Martha, I'm going to ask a rhetorical question. Do the Cuban people have the right to bear arms? Oh, absolutely not. Are you kidding oh, me? Oh, how, how dare, I, I mean, how dare like, you even ask that question? I mean, come on. There's there's no uh, there's no way for a Cuban citizen to, to have a weapon of any kind. But especially, I mean, again, we're talking about people who, who can barely afford to eat, eat and feed themselves. And, and there are no gun stores. It's not like here in America that one can just go, you know, to your neighborhood gun store and maybe buy guns. And so if you happen to have a relic that wasn't confiscated from your family at some point, we're talking about a gun from before 59. Wow. And then do you have any bullets to go with it? And I mean, I'm pretty sure you kind of need to update your guns, you know, maybe get a new one every now and then. So um, they definitely don't have anything to fight with. They um, are there's videos of people breaking up the sidewalks to use the chunks of concrete to throw at police. Wow. We saw them overturning a police car. Yeah. I mean, it's just amazing. Um, but going back to your point on corporations, <laughs> now that we're on it, um, you know, if corporations had the full power of the U.S. military and were able to, to fund their policies, you know, at the barrel of a gun, I think I think that we'd we'd be talking about corporations a lot more too. 
<laughs> you think you think yeah. that people might be a little more upset and you know it's funny we don't see our friends predominantly in the left and i'm gonna go after them right now I, we don't worry we go after our friends in the right too but right now because this is the direct result of the the leftist i got the leftist wet dream. What could it be like, right? That was Cuba. You had Michael Moore. <laughs> that, that, oh, Michael Moore. Don't God. even, don't even. <laughs> Praising Cuba's healthcare system. Oh, yeah. when Early 2000s, Martha. And now here we are, fast forward to reality. And we're seeing the direct implications of the socialist policies laid forth right before our eyes. You can't, you, you can't ignore the outcomes anymore and to your point this is all because of the advent of newer technologies which it goes back to my point i make time and again is that as we have more and more technology and the new status quo starts to get set whatever that new status quo is for that generation is going to start to advance it even further because now they're going to say this is it this is all i have what what's next what can we do more with this and that's just going to incentivize more people to want to be able to communicate and look what's happening in cuba this is a direct result of be people being able to share information how how powerful is that martha i mean the fact that it's just the ability and i i i'll end with this this is why the first and second amendment are so important your mm -hmm. ability to freely speak and communicate ideas and your ability to defend yourself when somebody tries to stop you from speaking your ideas. At the end of the day, that's why they are the most important amendments we see here in America. Now, I know they're just written on a piece of paper, but the point of it is that that's why they were the first two. So people could make sure that they were able to not only speak freely, but then defend that right. So Martha, with that being said, let's the tail end of the show, go towards <laughs> the, the libertarian conundrum, right? You, you see the instinct, uh, the instinctual, I guess, reaction from the right. We should do something militarily. We should send in our troops to help support those freedom fighters. And I, I hear a lot of folks in the right get excited. They're, they're ready to go volunteer themselves, it seems. Martha, is that the right approach from a libertarian perspective? From a libertarian perspective, absolutely not. We shouldn't be involving our troops. We shouldn't be uh, going to war. We shouldn't be doing any of that. Um, but from the libertarian perspective, why not allow free people to travel to the island and do what they feel that they need to do, whether that's bring aid or, or go further than that? I think that that's the problem with the government, um, you know, always being involved and always uh the United States caused this problem in a way. Um, I know people always refer to the embargo. The embargo isn't what caused this, um, but it, it the United States is, hasn't exactly stopped this from happening. So the war on drugs is a huge reason why the Cuban regime has had so much money and power. Preach! Um, most... <laughs> Thank you. Most um, most drugs that come into the United States, the ones that don't go through Mexico into California, come in through Miami, through the Cuban waters. And so that um, provides the regime with so much money, not only in Cuba, but in Venezuela and Nicaragua. I mean, this war on drugs provides the money that these regimes need to continue to to hurt their population. Forget about what it does in the United States, because that's a whole nother issue and how it devastates poor people in Latin America. It's just the policy is a disaster. It's up there with this proclamation uh, 6867 that I think needs to go away so people can take care of their own. We don't need the government to get involved. We need people people to get involved, people to do what they need to do, what, you know, bring, bring supplies, bring things to the island and help and support the Cuban people. Um, we don't need government involved in any of this, to be honest. But if they want to get involved, I mean, they're gonna, so. We don't need government involved. We need people. I wrote that down. That was a powerful quote. If I ever heard one there, Martha, well, you know what? Let's, um, Let's do this. Let's give you the last five minutes or so as we're going towards the tail end of the program. I want to give you, Martha Bueno, the platform to talk about whatever it is you want to talk about. You're running for office. You, you've you seen, I, I mean, so much is happening now down the Miami area. You obviously had that tragic condo collapse um, happening right there in your backyard. Uh, you're seeing what's happening just over, what, 90 miles away from your shores down in Cuba. So there's a lot happening right now in the greater Miami-Dade area. So with that, go for it. Floor is yours, Martha. What's on your mind? 
Thanks so much. Um, wow, that's a that's a kind of an open ended question there. So um, yes, the condo collapse was an absolute tragedy, and that is not over. They're still searching, and um, you know that's that work is still uh, ongoing as we speak. And um, then, of course, this issue with Cuba. I just want to take this opportunity to say, if you're watching this, please go ahead and retweet something about Cuba. Post something on Facebook. Uh, help us in that manner. Like I said earlier, there's not a whole lot we can do just yet. Um, I would really like to see this uh, proclamation taken away so that Cubans and others can go to the island and not fear coming back. If we are free people, we should be free to travel to a country and offer our assistance. It's our lives and our uh, vessels and our goods that we're going to be taking down there. There's no reason for the United States government to stop us from doing that. And so um, other than keeping our eyes on Cuba, which they absolutely need, um, as I mentioned, the the um, troops that, that Cuba had sent out to Venezuela are back in Cuba. And there's reports uh, also of Russian troops in Cuba. So this is, um, you know, really intense. It's going to intensify. It's going to be a bloodbath. And so what Cubans are asking for, um, you know, if we if we're not going to go intervene on their behalf um, or bring guns or whatever, they need uh, more than anything is the people of the world paying attention to what's going on there, because uh, the Cuban regime is not going to act as strongly if they know they're being watched. Um, to that point, today is the anniversary of um, the tugboat in, in Havana Harbor that that was drowned, that was taken down by the Cuban government themselves. And the only reason they stopped that was because a uh, Greek sh ship was coming into the harbor and they did not want the international attention. That story is, uh, uh, the tugboat is called El 13 de Marzo, the 13th of March. And it was um, Cuban dissidents that were trying to leave the island. The boat was filled to the brim with children. And the Cuban uh, government, with uh, sanctioned by Raul Castro, used water cannons to, to bring down the ship and drown. Uh, a lot of the children died that were inside the ship, died. Um, and then as that was happening, the Cuban Coast Guard went around in circles to try and create a vortex to drown people. And they only stopped and started rescuing people when that Greek ship showed up into the harbor. So this is um, the reason I bring this up, besides the fact that it's its anniversary, is to let people know this is the type of regime we are dealing with. We're not dealing with people that, you know, care about human rights. We're not dealing with people who care about the Cuban people. Cuban people have been prisoners on this island for the past 62 years. And this is what happens when, you know, the real plantation owners um, are, are scared of, of the, the revolt of their subjects. And this is what's happening. And they are going to murder people on Cuba if we take our eyes off. So please, please, please. Um, I ask everyone to please keep your eye on Cuba. Retweet if you can, just once, um, twice if you can, <laughs> if you're feeling generous. Um, but please, please help us keep the eye of the world on Cuba. Um, it's so needed, and I am so grateful to everyone that has. Um, Spike Cohen, he's awesome. I think he's he's you know just such a great human being, and I I appreciate it. Uh, Joe Jorgensen also retweeted and has been keeping up to this. So. I sincerely appreciate the people in the party that are, are helping us with this mission. Absolutely. Martha, thank you for, for bringing both your expertise, your knowledge and history of what's happening in Cuba to the audience. And I think right now this is top of mind. And what do we talk about here in the program, Martha? Meeting people where they're at, right? And right now this is where people are at. They're paying attention. And now more than ever, it's important for us to enter into the conversation and not only uh, enter that conversation, but give the libertarian solution. So that being said, you mentioned, give it a retweet. Where can folks go ahead and follow you for your uh, YouTube listener? They're going to see here at the bottom of the screen. But for your audio listener, Martha, where can they follow you? All right. So Twitter, as I mentioned, is at Martha Bueno 18. I don't know why the 18. Apparently there are 17 other Martha Buenos, but I am Martha Bueno 18. Um, I, th I also have a Spanish one. I don't know if anyone in your audience uh, speaks Spanish, but if you do, it's at Bueno Español. And then Facebook, uh, facebook.com slash Bueno for Miami and Instagram at Bueno for Miami. Awesome. So what we'll do, we'll include those links for Martha in the show notes for you audio listener. It's an easy find YouTube listener. 
go ahead, open the description right there, but also make sure you hit the little like button and give us a little notification uh, bell button hit so you're not missing a single time. Yeah, we have a conversation like this that's going to actually air the day we record it. Surprise, surprise. I don't always do that, folks. But hey, with that being said, Martha Bueno, thank you for all you're doing. And thank you for joining us on today's special episode of The Brian Nichols Show. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate this. Alrighty, folks, that's going to wrap up my conversation with Martha Bueno. What an awesome conversation. And thank you, Martha, for being able to hop in the show so quick to discuss, yes, this very important top of mind issue from a libertarian perspective and from someone who actually knows what's going on. I don't know, because your mom broke out your dad from a jail in Cuba from the communists. That's pretty badass. I still think that's pretty awesome. So guys, if you enjoyed today's episode, here's what you're going to do, because this is, as Martha said, probably the number one thing you can do, and that is help get eyeballs on the Cuban situation. So, so please share today's episode and make sure when you do tag yours truly and tag Martha, uh, and we'll make sure we uh, include Martha's social media there in the show notes. So that's easy for you guys, uh, you guys to go ahead and find, uh, but where you can find me at B Nichols Liberty, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and TikTok. Uh, and now some housekeeping coming up here in August. If you are heading down to Orlando, Florida, the first week of August, I will be down there the fifth through the seventh joining young Americans for Liberty at revolution 21 on media row. I am so excited to be there because we're going to be interviewing some of the top people in the greater Liberty world. But if you were attending, please make sure you stop by, say hi to yours truly, Chris Goizetta. And Hey, we might have a few surprise guests there as well, but I would love to see you. So maybe stop by, grab a quick picture and Hey, we're going to have a, a, some opportunities to get some swag maybe some personalized swag that's Young Americans for Liberty Revolution 21 in Brian Nichols show branded. I don't know, maybe, hint, hint, stop by our booth. It'll be a lot of fun. August 5th through the 7th. Also, wanted to go ahead and say, if you have not had the chance yet, I would love to hear what your thoughts are about the Brian Nichols Show. So here's what you're going to do. Email me, brian at briannicholsshow.com. And what I'm going to do is if you email me your thoughts, I'm going to enter you into our 100 YouTube subscriber giveaway. Woo! This is where uh, my audio guy, Bill, throws in like, you know, bells and whistles in the background. He's not really going to do that. I'm not going to ask him to do that. But the reason being is because, yes, we just passed 100 YouTube subscribers. And I am so thankful for uh, for you guys for helping us reach that milestone. Obviously, we want to get to 1000. But for that initial 100, and we just started back in April. So that's pretty darn cool. Uh, and th that's that's something that I never thought we'd be doing. So thank you, Chris, for getting us here uh, to, to actually start this YouTube channel. Chris Goizetta, you, you little marketing guru, you. Uh, so what we want to do is number one, hear from you guys. I want to hear what you guys think of the Brian Nichols show. It's been a big change and I've been hearing from you guys here and there, but let's formalize it. So what I want you to do is email me, brian at briannicholsshow.com. And I want you, the subject line to be Brian Nichols show, 100 subscriber questions. Sure. Why not? I don't know. Make it obvious. I'll, I'll go with whatever you send me. It'll be obvious. Don't worry. No no harm, no foul. But I want to hear what your thoughts are on the program. So email me, brian, at briannicholsshow.com. I will pick one of you lucky winners, and you're going to get something fun from Proud Libertarian. Uh, and I might even give you dealer's choice. So again, email me your, your thoughts on how the show's been going. And if you really like the show and you just want the world to know, Go to briannicholshow.com forward slash reviews. You can give us a five-star rating and review. Tell people what value you get here from the Brian Nichols Show. Did you get value from our conversation today with Martha Bueno? I would love to hear about it. And if so, again, a quick five-star rating and review. Also, if you want to help support the program, you can go ahead and become a $5 or $10 a month Patreon subscriber. Head over to briannicholshow.com forward slash support. And I want to thank our uh, existing amazing Patreon subscribers and supporters, Daryl Schmitz, Laura Stanley, Michael Lemma, Mitchell Mankiewicz, Hody Johns, Craig DaCosta, and the great We Are Libertarians. Big channel, thank you for everybody for supporting us here on The Brian Nichols Show. And yes, this is how we are able to reinvest back into the program, reach new people out there who are empathetic and interested in learning the message of liberty as it pertains to the problems they see in their surrounding, uh, their surrounding lives, their surrounding problems, their surrounding families, communities, whatever it may be, let's meet them where they're at. So with that being said, today was supposed to be a conversation uh, with Stephen Ken talking about Star Wars, but guess what? 
going to do you something better because I was just over on Stephen Kent's awesome program, Rightly, uh, over on the Al Jazeera network. I know, strap in there on his awesome program, Now uh, now Hear This. And I'm so excited to uh, join Stephen to talk about how Loki has some overtly libertarian perspectives and concepts that's been discussed throughout the uh, Disney Plus series. So if you have not had the chance yet, head over to Disney Plus, check out those first five episodes, and then airing tomorrow, and that being today, Wednesday, I'm recording here on Tuesday night, by the way, um, we're going to be ha having the conversation that I had with Stephen uh, airing, so I'll make sure I, I share that. So uh, head over to my Twitter at B Nichols Liberty, and I'll make sure I, I retweet that so you guys can go ahead and find that. Uh, and also, it'll be included in our, our uh, email that we send out there every single week. Uh, head over to briannicholsshow.com forward slash Liberty Friends ebook. Sign up for the free four easy steps you can Im implement now to sell Liberty to friends and family ebook and get entered into our awesome email uh, thread where we talk about our morning sales huddle as well as a weekly highlight of all what we've done here at the Brian Nichols show. So with that being said, yes, Stephen Kent, I was over on his program and he was over on the Brian Nichols show talking about his brand new book that I have already pre-ordered. I am so excited about how the force can fix the world. It's a great book talking about, yes, the very thing that we talked about when he was on the show the first time, Star Wars, because there's overarching themes of state versus the individual more state-controlled power versus that individual freedom. It was a great conversation with Stephen, and we specifically talked about the element of fear. Fear is the path to the dark side. So if you want to go ahead and check out a great conversation with a great guy, please go ahead and make sure you've hit that magic subscribe button. Of course, if you're on the YouTube, hit that magic notification bell. Give us a thumbs up. But with that being said, make sure you tune in here to check out our awesome conversation with Stephen Kent. But with that being said, it's Brian Nichols signing off here on The Brian Nichols Show for Martha Bueno. We'll see you Friday. Thanks for listening to The Brian Nichols Show. Find more episodes at briannicholsshow.com.